according to the main statement of Viet's theorem, we have, if we're looking at the sum and the product of the roots of a cubic, we're looking at the first symmetric polynomial and the third symmetric polynomial of the roots of a cubic. So just to declutter our space a little bit here, get rid of some of this stuff. And we have on our other slide the first elementary symmetric polynomial in the three roots of a cubic is the sum of those three roots. And the third elementary symmetric polynomial in the roots of that cubic is the product of those three roots. Now let's look at the right-hand side of what is Viet's theorem going to tell us. So on this first row, i is equal to 1. And so the sum of the roots of a cubic is going to be negative 1 to the first power times a to the 3 minus 1, so that's a2, divided by a3, the leading coefficient. So in other words, minus a2 over a3. In other words, this would be the opposite of the ratio of the quadratic coefficient to the cubic coefficient. So we can find the sum of the roots of a cubic without knowing the roots themselves, just using the coefficients. Again, that's the power of Viet's theorem. How about the product? What is i down here? Two, three. i is 3 down here. And so when I get this ratio, it's going to be a sub 3 minus 0. Uh, sorry, 3 minus 3, which is 0. Same verbal mistake I made when I wrote this last time. And then divide that by a sub 3, the leading coefficient. But negative 1 to the third power is negative 1. So here's a contrast. When we have a sum and product theorem for cubics, both of them have minus signs. Unlike the one for quadratics, where only one of them had a minus sign. What's the reason for that? How come it happened for cubics this time? Maybe I'll ask, where is the plus version? All right. The positive version is only going to happen with degrees that are even, elementary symmetric polynomials with even degrees. Um, the sum and the product, when we have three roots, are both odd degree. The sum is degree 1, the product is degree 3. But let's invoke this result on a particular cubic just to get some practice with it before I turn you loose on some practice in your groups today. So let's pick a cubic. Uh, let's see. What's everyone's favorite cubic polynomial? How about t to the third minus 2t squared uh, plus 3t minus 6? So there's a cubic. Um, let's quickly write down what are the values of these coefficients that we use in Viet's theorem, a0, a1, a2, a3. What's a0 for this polynomial? Negative 6, the constant coefficient. a1, 3, a2, negative 2, a3, 1. So I picked here a polynomial with a leading coefficient equal to 1, and so it follows exactly the form of the theorem 190 written in your text. Um, so with those coefficients in mind, let's see, without solving this polynomial equation, if we can find out what the sum of its roots are. That's S1, which is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3. What was this supposed to be according to Viet's theorem? Negative A2 over A3. And we know what A2 and A3 are. Negative 2 and 1, respectively. So if we believe Viet's theorem, the sum of the roots of this cubic has to be and again, we can know that without knowing what the roots themselves are. Okay. Um, turns out that I think we can solve this uh, to find the roots of p. Um, but the great part is we don't have to. So that's for the sum. How about the product? That's S3. Alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. What did Viet's theorem say this is supposed to be? Negative 0. Minus the zeroth degree coefficient 
over the leading coefficient. And so in our example, that's So we don't know what the roots of this cubic are. But we do know that they have to add up to 2, and they have to multiply together to give me 6. This sounds an awful lot like how you factor quadratics. Right? Those of you who work in math services, we do this on a daily basis uh, with students coming down and working on algebra. Right? Um, so this, this much we know. Um, but it's not enough information for a cubic just to know the sum and the product of the roots to determine the roots. We need one more piece of information. We need that missing link, that, uh, that S2, the second degree uh, elementary symmetric polynomial. Um, and so we'll look at that in, in a moment. But let's actually go through the fun of finding what these roots are, actually, and verifying that they add up and multiply up to what we claim they do. Um, how could I possibly find the roots of this cubic? Factor out of t squared from the first two terms. So I'll get t squared times t minus 2. And then factor out a 3 from the second two terms. And how come that works? Now you can factor out the t minus 2. Now we can factor out the t minus 2. And we end up with t squared plus 3 times t minus 2. And so what are my three roots? Plus minus plus minus root negative 3. I'm going to try to avoid using the word i, or the letter i. And then 2. So one of the roots of this polynomial is rational. The other two are not rational. Um, one of the results that's going to flow from Viet's theorem is the rational roots theorem. Um, and so maybe we'll see that rearing its ugly head uh, in this example. Um, but now that we've actually found out what these three roots are, let's go through the motions. If I add these three together, what happens? Yeah, because the plus and minus square root of negative 3 cancel one another out. And sure enough, the sum of the roots is 2. Um, and how about the multiplication part? Yeah, well, yeah, you can believe me that we get 6. Um, you can also just multiply these together. Square root of negative 3 times negative square root of negative 3 is negative negative 3, which is 3, times 2. That gives you 6, as predicted. So, of course, the, that's the, the magic of all this, right, is that we didn't need to know what the roots were to know what their sum was and know what their product was. Um, but there's one more elementary symmetric polynomial that we haven't said anything about. And to think about what that one is, that's the second degree elementary symmetric polynomial, which is not quite the sum and it's not quite the product, but it's something in between. Um, to think about what it is, let's imagine for the moment that we finished completely factoring this polynomial into its linear factors. So take this t squared plus 3. How would you factor that t squared plus 3? We can't factor it over the rationals, so let's factor it over the reals, or the, sorry, the complex one. How would that t squared plus 3 factor? t plus 5 is negative 3. t plus radical negative 3. And t minus. t minus radical negative 3. So here's a complete factorization of this polynomial. Now let's imagine doing that step that your algebra teachers always tell you to do, but then a lot of people ignore on the tests. I know, because I just graded a bunch of tests last night. Um, and that step is to check your work by multiplying this back out. So let's, as a thought experiment, multiply out this product of three linear factors. If we do that, we're going to get a t to the third term, necessarily, that comes from choosing the t from each one of these three factors to multiply together. And that's great. Um, we're going to get a t term. I'm skipping over t squared for the moment. But where is our t term going to come from? It's going to come from choosing t once and choosing the constants the other two times. Oh, actually, yeah. yeah. So one of the terms that goes into our t is going to be the product of negative 2 and negative radical minus 3. In other words, we can think of it as uh, 
a3 times a1. Actually, it's a3 times a2. And that's going to be one of the addends that makes up the coefficient of t. Where are our other addends going to come from? What are the other ways of getting a single power of t when I multiply these three factors out? Alpha 1, alpha 3. Alpha 1, alpha 3. In other words, I'm choosing the numerical, co the numerical terms of the first and the third factors, but I'm choosing the t from the second factor. When I multiply that out, I'm going to get an alpha 1 times an alpha 3. When the dust all settles with this and we combine like terms, those are going to add together because they all have a single power of t on them. And there's one more. Which one am I missing? Alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha one, alpha two which we would get when we multiply this out by choosing the t from the last factor and choosing the numerical terms from the first two factors. Alpha 1, alpha 2. That exhausts every possible combination that gives me a single power of t. This single power of t, the coefficient, is supposed to be a1. And according to Viet's theorem, if we divide a1 by the leading coefficient, which in this example is 1, we're supposed to get the second elementary symmetric polynomial. So our second elementary symmetric polynomial is staring at us in the face. It's right there. So it's not quite the sum, it's not quite the product, but it is the sum of every pairwise product. A2, A3. And according to Viet's theorem, this is supposed to equal negative 1 to the power 2 times A to the 3 minus 2 divided by A3. And we said a1 was 3, a3 was 1. So if we were to take the roots, and I'm not going to do this, and form this combination with them, take all the pairwise products, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 1, alpha 3, alpha 2, alpha 3, add those all together, the result has to come out to be 3. There's the second elementary symmetric polynomial. And this is a complete list of all the elementary symmetric polynomials. I suppose we could have had an elementary symmetric polynomial of degree 0, which would then be equal to negative 1 to the 0 times a3 over a3. That's just 1. So by definition, the 0th order elementary symmetric polynomial is just equal to 1. Um, and there's now a complete list of all the elementary symmetric polynomials that we could have. So the first thing to notice is that we can find all of their values just using the coefficients. That's the magic of Viet's theorem. But there's one more thing I want you to notice before we start working on this in groups. The roots of this polynomial were kind of nasty. What kinds of numbers were these? Integers. In general, rational numbers. Right? They belong to the same field as the coefficients did. That's significant. That's a key to unlocking this sentence that we've been saying to ourselves all semester. Permutation groups acting on polynomial rings and their roots. Because it turns out that whenever we ask for a fully symmetric combination of the roots of a polynomial, the value of that fully symmetric combination must belong to the same field as the coefficients. It can't be nasty. It can't be square roots of negative 3. It can't be complex. It can't be you know, things like e or pi or whatever. It belongs to the same field as the coefficients. So that's the last observation, is that because the right-hand side of Viet's theorem involves only what operation? What are we doing on the right-hand side of Viet's theorem? multiplying by either a plus or a minus 1, which is always a unit, and we're doing a division. And how do we know that this division is allowed? Because our coefficients form a field and what do we know about a n? It's the inverse of the leading coefficient. But what does a leading coefficient always have to be? Always has to be a unit because What's the one value that we can't have for a leading coefficient? Zero. 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 Right. So the only way that we couldn't do this is if the leading coefficient were zero, but leading coefficients are never zero by definition. So this combination that we have over here on the right-hand side, the unspoken uh, victory in this coefficient on, on the right-hand side is that it is always an element 
of the base field k, the coefficient field k.